G'day and welcome to the channel. Are you struggling to take sharp shots? Do your shots look nothing like the ones you see online? If this sounds like you, it's perfectly normal. Today, I'm gonna to do something very rare for photographers. I'm actually gonna share the photos that don't make it on social media. I'm gonna share a large collection of photos from myself, my members of the beginning shots when they just started, and then the progression. How do their photos look today? The growth is truly remarkable. And I honestly believe if you watch this video, if you stick with it, your images will improve just the same. I'm sorry to say that there's no secret setting for the camera. There's no no magic button that you have to push. Fundamentally, there's some key essential building blocks that will enable you to grow and improve your photos. What are those key essentials? We need to do a lot of practice, we need to do a lot of planning, we need to have a lot of persistence, we have to have a lot of patience, and of course the most key one, we have to have a lot of passion. And if you follow these five Ps, I promise you that photography will become an amazing, rewarding hobby just like it has for me. First, for a bit of motivation, I want to show you one of my members' shots before and after. He's definitely used the five Ps. So Darlin's actually been doing photography for 15 years, so he knows what he's doing, but he wanted to try wildlife photography. He was sick of driving long distances to get these sunrises and sunsets, but birds were everywhere. He could go down to a local park after work and just enjoy photography. So Darlin was actually using his Pentax K1 and 300 F4, which is 300 millimeters on a full frame, a little bit short. And he just started walking around as many of us do and just photographing what he could see. First shot that he took, this pair of American avocets. What a beautiful species this is. So Darlin's critique of the image was he was not low enough, he wasn't close enough, and he was shooting in harsh midday sun. And I tend to agree with him. The birds are just a little bit too far away and our angle's just a little bit too steep. So like many of us, Darlin became intoxicated with wildlife photography. He just loved it, but he wanted to improve. Now we knew failure was just part of this journey and he accepted that failure and just started going out at every opportunity he had. So he studied images that he liked online, he watched lots of YouTube videos like this one, he spent countless hours in the field and after about a year his images were absolutely remarkable, they were superb. He captured this absolutely stunning shot of the American Avocet in glorious afternoon light. The pose, the detail, the low angle all contribute to this engaging beautiful shot. By putting in a lot of effort, his growth was nothing short of remarkable. So what I love about Darlin's story is actually it mirrors mine almost to a T, except I didn't have the experience he had. I too took a couple of shots and became intoxicated. I was just wandering around with my wife's 40D and 70 to 200, which I still have, and I just photographed magpies, ducks, whatever I saw. When I look back on them, those images are absolutely terrible. But at the time, I didn't really care. I was just happy to find out what birds are in my local um, area, look up a bird book, find out what they were, and I was just enjoying myself. But like Darlin, I wanted to improve. I wanted to take better photos. So what lit the spark for me is my wife and I went for a bit of a walk and I took the camera and a cockatoo landed on a rock. Now I was a little bit wide, but it actually worked in this scenario. I've taken a shot of this cockatoo and I love this shot. And I just thought, how cool is that? We've got this cockatoo in its environment and something you know, just ignited within me. I think it's the feedback we get when we take a good shot. Like if we see it, we like it, we want to do that again, and it just snowballs. The high that we get from photographing something unique, some sort of behavior, it's just, oh, it's just amazing. <laughs> it's intoxicating. It's hard to explain, but I'm sure many of you watching this have experienced that. So one member that knows exactly what I'm talking about is Dean. He's definitely felt this rush of excitement. Um, he sent me this wonderful story and I'll share it with you now. So he was sitting in his backyard photographing some birds Birds. Here's the photo of his blind and his setup. So after about 20 minutes of non-stop action, Dean was having fun and then the birds just disappeared. And he thought, what's going on? And then he heard a blue jay making a bit of a fuss and some thick vegetation. And then he saw movement in the vegetation and he thought it might have been a raccoon. Then all of a sudden, he spotted a bobcat. And I'll just read in his words. So this is the first one I'd seen in daylight in several years and it was less than 10 yards away. The closest I'd ever been to one in my entire life. So the bobcat's then gone out into a bit of sunlight and in Dean's words he said he bleated like a young deer which has caused the bobcat to look in his direction, give him some eye contact, he's hit the shutter taking this amazing photograph. The entire episode lasted less than a minute but he said he will cherish this for the rest of his life. What an incredible story. Thanks for sending it to me, Dean. Uh, the photo is just absolutely sublime, and I'm sure many of you are sitting at home smiling, knowing exactly how Dean was feeling as he took it. That Just the excitement and the adrenaline when you take a shot like that, oh, it's just, just 
nothing compares to it. Well, maybe a few things, but for us photographers, it's hard to beat. Something I think all beginners, this is included myself, are very guilty of when we start, is we just want to get the bird as big as possible in the frame. So we get as close as we can, we frame up the bird, and we ignore everything else. Like I did with this magpie shot. This was one of my very first shots. The magpie takes up nearly all of the frame, and we have no sense of habitat or story or anything whatsoever. Once we get experience and we put in the practice, we start to realize that, hang on a minute, a good photo actually includes some habitat. It actually includes a story. I did a video all on how to take those engaging photos. You're free to check out. And if you look at this subsequent image I took of a magpie a few years later, we can see now that the subject fits nicely in its environment and its habitat, and it's a much better photo. Now, I must admit this is difficult, and I'm still challenging myself, but I encourage you when you're starting out, just think about the bigger picture. Don't necessarily think you have to get the bird or the subject massive, try to include a bit of habitat and you can crop in a little bit later. Remember Rhett highlights this perfectly when he, we look at the first image of a broad-billed hummingbird. In his words he said, nothing special about the composition, I probably should have moved back slightly, not horrible for my first shot, not good either. And I agree, it's actually quite a nice side profile, I'd be happy to photograph a hummingbird that's for sure, and it is definitely a good first image and he's done a lot of good things here. So nine years later he's still at it and he's had another opportunity to photograph a beautiful hummingbird and here's the shot that he's shared. Can you see just how much better the bird sits in this image compared to the first one? It just has room to breathe so that little bit of fruit in the bottom right adds a bit to the story. The bird's pose is beautiful, it's nice and sharp, got good eye contact overall. For me, it's definitely an improvement on that first image. In his words, he said, this is not what I would call my best or most popular, but for me, I really like it. And that's the key, isn't it? As long as we like it, that's all that counts. Someone else who improved this element of their photography is my member, Kyle. Kyle sent me his first image, which is actually a really good image if you're just starting out. Kyle's critique was, it's taken on an angle, background, it's somewhat blurred, it's busy distracting. There's also no action, behavior, or depth to give it interest. To be honest, I think you'd be a little bit harsh on yourself, Kyle. This is actually not a bad ID shot, and it looks nice and sharp, and I've got plenty of these sort of photos myself. It's nice that we want to improve, though, but don't be too hard on yourself if you take a shot like that. Five months later he actually got another opportunity to photograph this species and he saw the species feeding and he thought I want to have a bit more habitat, I want to make it a little bit wider. He's been conscious of his background and these are skills that we learn over time is before you take the shot consider your background, consider how the image is going to be. If you can see the composition before you take the photo it often leads to a much improved photo. And here's the shot that Kyle took and he said this bird was eye level, the eye contact's great, the background is pleasing, the plant gives it some depth, it captures some sort of behavior, and I do agree. It's a very nice shot, you know, the bird feeding in its habitat, and that's often what we're going for, so well done, Kyle. So another member that did a lot of practice in the field and improved her shots was member Sam. She sent me this photo of an eastern rosella in its habitat. Now these are pretty flighty birds and they can be very difficult to photograph. She started in September 2021 and in her words, I struggled with the shady vegetation. The bird was jumping around. I had a maximum 300 millimeters focal length. Now Sam also developed this insatiable appetite to improve, watched lots of videos on YouTube and just got out into the field as often as she could. So Sam's upgraded her lens to the Sigma 150 to 600, which gave her 600 millimeters. She's returned to the field, put in the practice, and this is the shot she was able to capture. And in her words, I love this photo because I'd been trying to capture a sharp, bright, colorful photo of an Eastern Rosella since I started photography. And this shot does that. I love the color, the eye contact, the pose, the vegetation is less cluttered than my earlier image. Overall, I was super happy with this shot and so you should be. It's amazing, it's excellent, and I would be happy to capture this. And I hope you're picking up here, everyone is improving. Everyone's shots from when they started to where they are now, the growth is incredible, and it's because they've put in the practice. Something that becomes extremely important during your journey is the planning that goes into getting these shots. I often say it's just a matter of being in the right place at the right time and getting lucky, but how do we know what is the right place? Like, where do we go to find birds? Where do we go to get these shots? For me, it's just a lot of scouting, it's a lot of research, it's a lot of networks, it's Facebook groups, it's eBird. There's lots of different things, but nothing really beats getting there yourself and seeing whether you can take a shot. Often just 
spots are really good for bird watchers or just nature lovers, but they're terrible for photos. So I often just have to visit them myself. Once I go to a spot and I know this is good for birds, I just keep going back there because you can get lots of different shots at the exact same location. For me, I desperately wanted to photograph the critically endangered Regent honey eater, the bird on top of my hat. It's very rare and it breeds in certain areas in Australia. And I've visited those areas a number of times, spending hours looking for this bird and never found it. However, because of my network of friends and Facebook, somebody spotted the bird in the middle of a town in the area where I lived. I couldn't believe it. My mate called me and said, there's a Regent honey eater. You need to go and see it and photograph it now. So I've raced down there in my car to this tree just in the middle of suburbia. Sure enough, there's a Regent honey eater feeding on this tree. Unbelievable. Got my camera. I've just madly taken some shots of it feeding in the eucalypt and we got a few shots that brought a massive smile to my face and I'm not sure I would have ever got that shot without that knowledge or those connections. So someone who took advantage of planning and a little bit of local knowledge is member Jacob. He only started bird photography in 2021. He's gone to a local forest. He's seen an ash-throated flycatcher. He's taken a shot. The light was pretty poor. The detail's not quite there and he's gone away but he wanted to return to get a better shot. So he's done exactly that the following year. He's gone back with the knowledge of the forest, the knowledge of the bird, what he's learnt through practice, he wanted to improve the shot. And this time he thought about the composition and the mood of the shot. He felt that was really important. And this is the image he was able to capture. In his words, he said, what I enjoyed most looking at this image is the bird's position in the scene within the natural environment, the contrast and the light gradient. I felt it complemented the mood and for how the light was shining on the subject and it, and it gives me an optimistic feeling. I agree, it's a real moody shot and gives us a feel for the subject and its habitat. So another member who's built up an extensive knowledge of their local area is member Gary. Gary's from the Kimberley region in Australia and it's absolutely stunning up there. He's put in a lot of time to find different birds. And one of the birds he's put in the time with is the crimson finch. This bird is spectacular. So here's Gary's first attempt at the bird and it's actually a really good one. I actually like it. We've got the bird in its habitat and it gives us a feel for where that bird is. But Gary wanted to highlight the beauty of these species. So five years later, He's photographed this crimson finch on a grass stalk and we see the bird in all its beauty. We've got nice eye contact, we've got fantastic detail, we've got that nice tail spread. Gary was very happy with this image. And I'm sure if you invest the time like Gary has, you will get those same rewards. So I often get lots of comments on my YouTube channel saying your passion shines through and I'm glad that it does because I honestly wouldn't want to be doing anything else. This is, well actually probably would want to spend some time with my wife but apart from that I just love being out with my camera, love being out photographing wildlife and it's this passion that keeps me going. So the big question is how do we find this passion? I'm not sure anyone truly knows the answer to that but for me I think it was just my willingness to learn, to accept failure and my drive to improve just by putting in the time. And when I saw the improvement, that was when I got that dopamine release. When I saw some improvement for my hard work, it just drove me to continue to improve. And someone else who shares my passion is member Yurka. She's been photographing birds as long as I have. She shared a buzzer shot that she took in 2011. And in her words, the sky was gray, it was a bit boring and the bird was flying away. Fast forward 11 years later, and she captured this absolutely incredible shot of the same species, this time with her R6 and RF 100 to 500. The timing on this shot is excellent and I just love the behavior she captured, the nesting material and its bill. The image is just superb. So she was kind enough to share the following with me and I'll read it to you now. I'm photographing birds because it makes me happy. It helped me to relax from daily work. To be with my camera, and to be in nature and look for birds is for me heaven on earth. I'm happy about each good image I take, but I'm not unhappy if I come home without any. Always I see something interesting. Now I absolutely love this and it's because it's true. I believe it's this mindset that she has is why her passion has lasted this long and why mine has as well. If we can just enjoy that experience, whether we get a good shot or a bad shot, it doesn't really matter, we will continue coming back. So another key skill we need as photographers is persistence. If you like the sound of getting up at 4am in the dark, driving for an age, going out and laying in the mud, waiting for birds, walking through tick and fisted grass, if this sounds like fun, wildlife photography is definitely for you. Of course, not every session is quite that dramatic, but I think beginners underestimate just how much time and effort is put into getting these shots. You have to have persistence. Somebody who puts in more time than any other photographer I've met is my good mate, Jan. His persistence and his drive to nail the shot 
is unparalleled. It's just incredible. Now Jan, like all of us, started somewhere. He was a beginner once upon a time and Jan shared with me one of his very first shots he took back in 2005 and we can see here that it's not a bad shot. We've got some feeding behavior going on but the bird's a little bit far away. His angle's a little bit steep. Fast forward a few years and after he's put in a lot of time, a lot of practice, he's upgraded his camera he now took this shot, which is just stunning really. Uh, we've got nice behavior, we've got the wings flapping, detail's great, he's down at a low angle. And again, it just shows that all of these amazing shots that you see on social media, all those photographers started somewhere. There is a recycle bin full of rejects before they got to that amazing shot. And I think we need to grasp that and understand that, that eventually we will get there too. We will end up taking those amazing shots. We just have to put in the work and go on the journey that they did. And that brings us to another really important skill and it goes up next to persistence and that is patience. We have to have a lot of patience with wildlife photography. We often have to sit in one spot for hours on end, looking through our viewfinder, just waiting for some sort of action to happen. But for me, I really enjoy this process. I love just watching these birds jump around the trees, listening to the bird call, the serenity. I'm not bothered by anyone else and I'm just sitting there with my thoughts, just enjoying myself. It's the anticipation of something that might happen. I think that keeps us going hour after hour. Probably sounds like some sort of medieval torture to some people, but for us photographers, we absolutely love it. But I will admit there's been plenty of times where I've been laying there shivering thinking, I want to go and get a hot cup of coffee and have a shower. But then part of me in my brain goes, no, just five more minutes and then five more minutes and then five more minutes. Half an hour later, I'm still laying there shivering, waiting for a bird to pop up. But often it's that patience of just waiting when something happens. How often have you been rewarded when you've just put in that extra little bit of five to 10 minutes? I remember distinctly one session I had, it was cold, I was wet, I was laying in the reeds and I was just waiting for some, something to happen. I was hoping some waders would come closer. Then out of nowhere, a common sandpiper lands literally 10 meters in front of me. It lands, it starts bobbing, it's looking at me. I cannot believe it. It might be common by name, but it's definitely not common. I've not, never photographed this bird before. So I'm laying there with my camera, my heart's racing, and the bird's got this bobbing behavior, and it just bobs towards me. It just came straight at me, and I was almost probably at minimum focus distance, and I'm just hammering away, massive smile, got the best shots I've ever got of this species. I, and I don't know if I'll ever get that opportunity again. And it was only because I just had the patience to do five more minutes. So I highly encourage you, next time you're about to quit, just say to yourself, give it five more minutes and you might be surprised what happens. So one of my members that has definitely put in the patience and the persistence is Will Johnson. He really struggled at the beginning to get some nice shots of this yellow hammer with his 70D and 405.6. The images he was getting were often soft and the bird would not stay still. Four years later, Will has definitely got another chance. He's put in a lot of time and he got this feeding shot of the same species, which has definitely improved on his first shot. So well done, Will. But the member with possibly the most patience has to be David. He waited 16 years between shots. Now his first shot is actually a really, really nice shot of a paper wasp on a flower. And this was actually taken on a 6.3 megapixel digital rebel camera. So even though this is a really nice shot, David wasn't 100% happy with it. He thought that a lot of the wasp was out of focus and he wanted a bit more story and behavior. So many years later, David captured this unique behavior of a paper wasp. He loved the shot as it captured the behavior when the female wasp chews the wood into a paper pulp-like substance that it uses for its nest. He loved how the entire wasp was in focus and he was very happy with how it turned out. So David's story highlights if you've got the persistence and the patience, it's just a matter of time before you'll re be rewarded with shots like this. So another member who actually set themselves this challenge of personal growth was my member John. During COVID, he was only sort of out for an hour a day doing some sort of exercise, and he made it a goal to improve his photography and photograph as many species as he could in his local area. One of his first shots was of the song thrush. John said he rushed the shot and didn't think too much about the composition. Later in the year, John got another chance with the same species, and this time he thought more about the mood and the feel of the shot, and he captured this shot. And I agree that it's got a lot more mood. The colors are complementary. We've got nice eye contact. The bird's proud in its pose and it's definitely an improvement. So well done, John. 
Now, if you're interested on how many species John photographed, he said he managed 53 different species and learnt a lot in the process. So well done, John. Thanks for sharing. And I just love John's story because that's what photography is all about. It's that personal satisfaction, that joy, and that sense of achievement that we get. That's what ultimately builds that passion. So often one of the biggest barriers for wildlife photography, and it puts off a lot of people, is the gear. A lot of people think they need to spend thousands on a lens like this Sony 200-600 to or this body. And yes, this gear is lovely and yes it does enable us to take good shots but it's not necessary if you've been on this channel a while you know i've used old gear and i've created a video showing the best budget gear for 2023 i highly encourage you to check that out the photos on there from old affordable gear is absolutely incredible in saying that often focal length is our biggest hurdle if you have anything less than 300 millimeters, you will struggle. And often going, say, from a 300 millimeter lens to 500 or 600 enables the subject to be much, much bigger. So remember, Tomaz has definitely done this when he upgraded from a 400 to a 600 millimeter lens. He took this shot of a beautiful bird, a swallow-tailed mannequin. This first image he took at 400 millimeters was just lacking detail. Still a nice shot, but didn't have the detail he was after. He's upgraded to a 600 millimeter lens, and now when we look at the detail he's able to capture, it's much, much better. We've got a nice feeding behavior here, but that focal length, I'm sure his skills and the time that elapsed between those two photos has contributed to the better detail. It's not just the gear, but that lens definitely helped. So another member who improved their shots, and this sort of highlights the benefit of focal length, Dan's 400 millimeters of this red-bellied woodpecker. The bird's quite small and it's high up in the tree. He's upgraded to a 600 and he wanted to get a shot of the bird big with lots of detail, and that new kit has enabled that. He could of course go backwards a bit more to change the composition, but having that focal length is definitely an assistant. Well, this sort of brings me to the end of this video and I've loved making this video. It's been so enjoyable. The growth of every single member has been truly remarkable. Every single member has improved their images from when they started. And I'm sure if you look at your own catalog, go back to the very first images you took, check them compared to the ones you take now i'm sure you've seen some growth there and you will continue to grow the longer you do it and the more effort that you put into it so you've probably heard me use the term member a lot of times today if you're not aware of what a member is it means that they directly support my channel so there's a little join button under the video if you hit the join button you can become a paying member for less than a cup of coffee per month that directly supports me to make content like this i often ask for images i share images that i've taken there's a lot of behind the scenes things going on there you get a cool little emoji next to your name i've got a calendar for 2023 that you can download for free it's got 4k images for your desktop your laptop your tablet it's really really nice and i hope you do enjoy that if you want to if you do join i'm very grateful and i appreciate that support obviously if you give the video a thumbs up it lets youtube know that you enjoyed the content and others might like it subscribe if you obviously want to see more of these videos and until the next video happy birding and just enjoy your journey now, before I go, I do have a few more images to share, some bonus images from my members. So I'll let you enjoy those now. So I just finished editing this video when I got an email from member Niall and I just had to share his story because it encapsulates everything that we've been talking about today. So Niall started photography, bird photography a couple of years ago. He's hired himself a big 150 to 600 Sigma sport lens, hoping that would get him much closer to the birds. He's gone into the bush, into the forest, and I'll just share what he had to say. He said, the day was overcast and I was inside a forest. I'd heard that you have to have a fast shutter speed to get detail or there would be blur. I was unbelievably clueless about the three parts of an exposure. ISO was through the roof. I didn't even know how to position for a cleaner background. I now know that for a stationary bird, there's no reason to have such a high shutter speed. Slowing it down would have given me a lot more light. I also could have changed my position to give me a better background. About the only thing I did right was spotting the bird. And I think this highlights the challenge all beginners face. We've got the lens, we think that's all we need. There's so many variables at play here in regards to the light, the settings, the positioning, how close you are, just a myriad of different things. Now he's stuck at it to his credit and a couple of years later he's upgraded his kit and that bird has showed up again. But this time he spotted that bird at a local beach and thought, hey, I've been watching a few of Dwayne's videos. I think I can get a good shot here by setting up a perch for the bird to land on. That's exactly what he did. Here's the perch that he set up. Now in his words, he said, I made sure that the sun was coming over my shoulder. Bird would be in the perfect light. Sure enough, around dinner time before sunset, he showed back up. He hopped over to my area and hovered over the perch for a few seconds before settling in. Dwayne, I can't even tell you how overjoyed I was that the perch worked. This amazing bird 
gave me pose after pose after pose. I was absolutely over the moon. I went from having hardly any shots to 20 of my best ever shots of this species. And he said, I mean this with all sincerity, this is very kind. I never would have gotten these shots if I hadn't learnt so much from your videos. And thank you so much, Noel, for sharing that. And it brings a smile to my face that you are learning and everybody's learning and improving their shots.